secrets of Scotland Yard. How do you know? Is there such a thing as the perfect crime? If so, it's no place in this program. For we're concerned with the majority of crimes, the imperfect ones. And yet, every so often, there comes a crime so very near to perfection that the criminals themselves must have believed at one stage of the game that they would really get away with it. And yet, invariably, they were wrong. Such is our case today. A classic in the annals of the tricksters. You've heard the expression, safe as the Bank of England. For more than a century, that expression has signified the stability of a great British institution. Stability, yes. But invulnerable, I wonder. The title of this program is The Bank of England Robbery. Standing on an island site in the heart of the city of London is the home of the old lady of Threadneedle Street. For this is the affectionate name by which the Bank of England is known the world over. Her stone walls are guarded at night by a company of guardsmen, and her gold and good name are guarded by day by the vigil of the clerks and managers. This is as true today as it was equally true almost 100 years ago. The time is the year 1873. Strolling along a city street in the summer of that year are two men. One is an inspector from Scotland Yard. The other is the famous American detective Arthur Pinkerton, who was over in England at the time in connection with some investigations for one of his American clients. Oh, a beautiful day, Inspector Shaw. Oh, yes, Mr. Pinkerton, you've certainly brought the fine weather with you. <laughs> I guess it's just a fallacy in America, but we always believe you have nothing but rain and fog in England. <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't like to conceal anything from you, Mr. Pinkerton. And we do have our fair share of fog and rain, but <laughs> all the same, I hey, think... What? Wait a minute. Oh, what is it? See those two fellows ahead of us? What, you mean those two businessmen? Yeah. And unless I'm very much mistaken, they're in a pretty queer business. Oh, can't say I recognize them. Hey, look, they're crossing the road. Come on, we'll keep on this side, but try to draw a level. Mm, no, they're strangers to me. Mm, but not to me. Unless I'm very much mistaken, their names are George Bidwell and George McDonald. Bidwell has been mixed up in crime all his life. McDonald is a convicted forger. Both of them are well-educated and will stop at nothing. Hmm, I didn't know they were in England. Well, oh, thanks for the information. Oh, uh, by the way, Pinkerton, do they specialize in any particular type of crime? Yeah, robbing banks. <laughs> Inspector Shaw arranged for the men to be shadowed. For the next few months, Scotland Yard kept a close watch on their movements. As an additional precaution, Scotland Yard sent a circular letter to the London banks, warning them of the presence of Bidwell and MacDonald in Europe. However, the majority of the banks had their own system of precaution, and the bank managers were not very impressed. Now these circular letters from Scotland Yard... I don't know what they take us for. A bunch of fools, I suppose. A couple of American tricksters over here. Uh, I suppose they think they can get away with the sort of trickery they use in New York. Oh, they get a surprise if they try it over here. I'd like to see them try it. His wish was to be fulfilled. The months went by, and no more news was heard of Bidwell and MacDonald. They both went over to the continent and Scotland Yard gave up their watch. Then, a few months later, Scotland Yard received an urgent message from the Bank of England. Thank goodness you're here, Inspector. Immediately my attention was drawn to this forgery, I sent for you personally. 
I, I felt that if any man could help us, it would be you. Oh, that's very kind of you, Mr. May. Well, now, suppose you give me all the facts of the case. Well, this morning, I had a message from Colonel Fraser, who is the manager of our West End branch. Among the bills cleared by him yesterday were two notes to the value of £1,000 each in the name of a very respectable financier, Mr. Blydenstein. You mean that these notes were signed by Mr. Blydenstein and were, in fact, promissory notes to the value of £1,000 each? Uh, that is correct. Each uh, notes such as these, provided they are genuine and signed by a reputable banker or financier, are accepted by the Bank of England as full security. In fact, just as if they were actual money. Ah, and in due course, these bills go through to Mr. Blydenstein, who pays them, and the transaction is completed. Yes, of course. Such bills are usually post-dated. In fact, that is the reason they're lodged with the bank. On the date stated, they would go to Mr. Blydenstein, who would pay up. And these bills were, I presume, credited to the account of one of your customers at the West End branch? Uh, yes, the account of a Mr. Warren, a businessman of considerable interest. Uh, he's an American. Oh, an American. You say he has considerable interest. Uh, has he had the account of the bank for a long time? Not a very long time. No, I, I've had a talk with Colonel Fraser, and I gather, in point of fact, he's only had Mr. Warren's account for about a year. Uh, but that, of course, is explained by Mr. Warren being an American. He's over here in connection with the construction of the new Pullman trains. He's having a number of these trains built in Birmingham for use in England and on the continent. Oh, how did you know this? Uh, he told Colonel Fraser. I see. Now, I, I, I should not want you to think that Colonel Fraser relied on Mr. Warren's word concerning his stability. During the past year, a considerable amount of business um, has gone through his account. I need hardly add that there's been no grounds for suspicion in connection with Mr. Warren's account. We've had bills against some of the most reputable bankers and finances in Europe, including Rothschild. And in every case, the bills were genuine, because they've been met. Yes, uh, but this one against Mr... Um, uh, Mr. Blydenstein. Uh, yes, this is a forgery. That is correct. And the awful thing is that we might not have known it for some time if it hadn't been for the mistake. No, oh, what mistake? Well, I told you, these bills were made out to be payable on a certain date. Yes. Well, on this particular bill, there was no date. It was noticed by one of the clerks, and Colonel Fraser sent it round to Mr. Blydenstein to have the correct date added. It was then we learnt it was a forgery. And when did Mr. Warren hand this bill into the bank? He didn't actually hand it in. I understand that he's been away in Birmingham for the last few months, and he had been in the habit of sending bills by registered post. Sending bills? Oh, in fact, you mean that he's made a habit of this uh, sending bills? Yes. <sighs> And uh, what's the state of his account? Well, there's about £5,000 in it. A, a very considerable amount of money has passed through the account in the past few months, and most of it has been withdrawn through cheques made payable to a Mr. Horton, who has an account at the Continental Bank in London. Mm -hmm. And what money has been paid into Mr. Warren's account to meet these cheques? Uh, not much money. M most of it is represented by bills which will fall due during the next few months. Oh. And in the meantime, the Bank of England has credited Mr. Warren. Uh, about how much money do these bills represent? Well, I, I've only glanced at the figures, but I should estimate it must be something in the neighborhood of 100,000 pounds. thousand pounds. Mr. Warren didn't do things by halves. Immediately, Scotland Yard acted. Obviously, the account at the Continental Bank, in the name of Horton, was the means whereby the criminals were extracting the money. On the very day while Mr. May and the inspector were visiting the Continental Bank, a young man came in to cash one of Mr. Warren's cheques. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I've come to cash this check. Oh, thank you, sir. Hmm. It's, uh, it will just wait one moment, will you, sir? Yes, that's the account. All right, Mr. May. Uh, just one moment, please. 
Yes? Anything the matter? I'm a police officer. If you'd accompany me to the manager's office, I'd like a word with you. <laughs> the young man, whose name was Noise, turned out to be the clerk to Mr. Horton. He denied all knowledge of the plot and said that he'd only been in Mr. Horton's employment for a matter of months. We've checked up at the lodging house where he's staying, and I gather that he talks quite freely of his post with Mr. Horton. When did he meet Horton? Who evidently he put an advertisement in the newspaper saying that he was seeking a situation and could put up some money as a guarantee of his being trustworthy. He gave Horton £150 to keep in trust. <laughs> Needless to say, Horton has disappeared. All the same, I don't quite trust Mr. Noyes. I think he knows more than he's saying. Further inquiries reveal that Noyes had come from America and that he'd arrived only six months ago. Pinkerton, the American detective, was now back in New York and acting on behalf of the bank. He helped Scotland Yard with information they urgently needed. Pinkerton advised London that a relative of Noyes had received that same month a draft for a thousand pounds. For a junior clerk, Mr. Noyes was very well paid. It's no use, you know. You'd better tell us the truth. Where did you get this thousand pounds? What thousand pounds? Did Horton give it to you? I don't know what you're talking about. Where is Horton? I warned you before, you'd do well to tell all you know. But the gang had chosen well. They knew that noise would keep his mouth shut. Already, however, the gigantic proportions of the crime had aroused the indignation of the country. It transpired that every one of the bills held by the Bank of England were forged. All the genuine bills that had been passed through the account of Mr. Warren during the previous year had been used by the gang both to create confidence in Mr. Warren's stability and to act as a basis for the forgeries they were planning to carry out. The Bank of England to use an American expression of a different generation, had been taken for a ride. Needless to say, Horton, Warren, and every trace of the money had completely disappeared. The hunt was on. of detection on the part of Scotland Yard and Pinkerton to identify Horton and Warren as George Bidwell and George MacDonald. The only pity was their previous warning to the London banks was not taken a little more seriously. We know for certain that MacDonald left England before the very first forged bill was lodged at the bank. He was taking no risk. He went to France and so far we haven't picked up his trail. But we've reason to suspect, however, that he's headed for South America. But what about the money? Ah, that isn't going to be easy to trace. After Noyes cashed the cheque at the Continental Bank, he took the banknotes to the Bank of England and exchanged them for gold sovereigns. Surely we can find this hoard of gold? Ah, hold on a minute. I believe they changed the gold back into notes, back into gold sovereigns, and then into American bonds. <laughs> One can't help admiring their thoroughness. I really cannot share your admiration. Yes, no, Mr. May, I don't suppose you can. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that if MacDonald has got away, Bidwell is still in this country. We're having every port watched, and we're putting our own Scotland Yard men to keep an eye on the American boats. I don't think he'll get away. George Bidwell was a man of infinite resource. He actually followed Noyes on his visit to the bank on that ill-fated day. And he'd seen him come out, accompanied by a police officer, and immediately realized that the game was up. To endeavor to get out of England in any ordinary way was out of the question. Although Bidwell was only some 40 years old, he'd spent the greater part of his life dodging the police of various countries. Having destroyed all the evidence at his lodgings, he made his way to one of London's great railway stations. He took the precaution of having a porter buy his ticket to Dublin 
And then, to quote his own words. I intended taking the 9 p.m. mail train, and as a precaution, I waited until the last moment after the passengers were on board and the waiting room doors shut. As the mail was being transferred from the wagons to the train, I took the opportunity to walk through the big gate unobserved amid the rush and confusion. The car doors were all locked, but on showing my ticket to a guard, he let me into a compartment. No doubt supposing that I had obtained admission to the station from the waiting room and had been loitering about. The same was probably the case with the two or three other men looking out of the waiting room window at the platform whom I judged to be detectives. The train rolled out of the station, and soon I was leaving London behind at the rate of 50 miles an hour. After midnight, we took the steamer to Holyhead and arrived at Dublin about 7 a.m. I should not have felt so comfortable throughout this night's journey had I known that the telegraph was flashing in all directions. £500 reward for the capture of George Bidwell, who is supposed to be one of the persons engaged in the great bank forgery. He is an American citizen, about 40 years of age, a dark complexion, and is alleged to be an island. Bidwell went on to Cork, and as he left the station, was followed by two detectives. One of them inquired whether he'd ever been there before. With a haughty yes, he walked slowly away. He made his way to a wharf where a tender was waiting to convey passengers and mail to the liner SS Atlantic. On entering, I found the place crowded and the tugboat ready to convey the passengers to the steamer Atlantic. Before attempting to step aboard the tug, I took a look around and saw my two detectives standing back in one corner with their eyes fixed on me all but their heads being concealed behind the crowd, waiting to see their friends off for America. Apparently unconscious of their presence, I threw my papers one by one down among the passengers, and as the deck of the boat was eight or ten feet below, the detectives could not see to whom they were being thrown. I stood leaning on the rail for a short time, gazing at the scene, then left the wharf, not even glancing in the direction of the detectives. I felt that any attempt of mine to embark would precipitate their movement. Therefore, I had once abandoned all ideas of taking passage for Queenstown. Bidwell was luckier than he realized at the time. On that trip, the Atlantic struck a rock off the coast of Nova Scotia, and of a thousand and two people aboard, 560 lost their lives. All the rest of the evening, George Bidwell spent in trying to shake off the detectives who were shadowing him. Quite likely, these men were only acting on a general suspicion and did not care to take any definite action till they were made more sure that he was the wanted man. He stayed that night at a commercial hotel. When he went to the post office, where he'd arranged to collect mail in the name of Bodo, he realized that he was being watched. He hired a jaunting car and set off to the country. Sure, you're a nervous man, sir. Nervous? Why should I be nervous? And why should you tell me in any case? You need not be frightened of me, sir. There's many a true patriot in Ireland that's nervous these days. I know you are a patriot, sir, and there are many doing what you're doing. How do you know I am? Trust in me. There are many in Ireland who will protect you. When they reached a small town, Bidwell dismissed the jaunting car and decided to stay the night at an hotel. Glancing at a recent paper in the sitting room, he learned for the first time that his real name was known to the police, that he was suspected to be an island. I sat in a hotel, utterly dumbfounded, bewildered, paralyzed. 
I'd experienced some shocks, some takedowns in my time, but never one to compare with this. Arousing myself from a state of mental stupefaction, hitherto unknown, I put the paper into the fire and retired to the room allotted to me. But in the morning, he was off on the road again, posing as a penian, an Irish revolutionary. He managed to make his way to Dublin. He put up at a small hotel and might well have escaped attention if he hadn't left behind him his scarf with the initials G.B. This was seen by one of the maids. I found this in his room, sir. He must have left it out when he was packing. Ah, this is our man, all right. I want every man you can spare to watch all the trains from Dublin tonight. Very good, sir. He must not get away. He must not get away. But he did, to Belfast, where, pretending to be a Frenchman, he managed to get on a boat to Glasgow. From there, he went on to Edinburgh, where he posed as a German medical student. For over three months he lived there, corresponding with friends in America and successfully concealing his identity. Every day he went for a brief stroll to buy the latest Edinburgh and London papers. The news agent, not entirely taken in by Bidwell's disguise, felt there was something suspicious about his customer. He happened to mention it to another customer who worked for a firm of lawyers. And among the clients of this firm of lawyers, was the Bank of England. By such a slender chain of circumstances and luck, information concerning this mysterious stranger came back to Scotland Yard. Bidwell was followed. He took flight and tried to get away. This time, he did not succeed. I tell you, I'm no Fanian. I did. Then what do you want me for? For forgery. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. Meantime, the arrest of the other principal in the conspiracy was no less tinged with melodrama. There was a worldwide hue and cry. In America, Pinkerton was leading exhaustive inquirers into the background of the gang. A trail, in the end, led to Cuba, where other members of the gang were found and arrested. As for MacDonald, he fled aboard the liner Thuringa, and his arrest was only a deep after a melodramatic boat race in the New York harbor. And what of the loot? Among a few clues which had not been destroyed by MacDonald and Bidwell was a letter which mentioned a certain Major Matthews. Though this name is our guide, we went through the shipping records of every mailboat company. And at last we found trace of a trunk of clothing which had been sent to the depot of the North Atlantic Express Company in New York to be called for by Major Matthews. Wrapped up in the soil linen were found three bundles of bonds to the total value of almost $300,000. Those of you who are inclined to think that the modern criminals know more tricks than their predecessors, remember this amazing story occurred in 1873. When the various accused came to trial in August of that year, there was such a vast array of evidence against them that there was little to be said in their defence. It says much for their characters that they were principally concerned in seeing that the innocent did not suffer for their actions. Bidwell spoke of the manager of the West End branch of the Bank of England. I should like to say concerning Colonel Fraser that I hope as the years go by his resentment against me will wear away. I know that a lot of people have blamed him, but I should like to say that any other man in London, however able, had he been in Colonel Fraser's position, would have been deceived by us. I'd like to say how sorry I am that he was deceived. That is all I have to say. The commercial world was horrified by the revelation that the greatest bank in England could be tricked, deceived and despoiled. In those days of harsh sentences, the criminals could have little hope of mercy. On the eighth day of the trial, after the men had been found guilty, the Lord Chief Justice proclaimed sentence. You, who now ask for mercy, and who are not restrained by respect for law and honesty, must be met with a terrible retribution. 
And it should be well known that persons who commit crime, which only persons of education sometimes commit, will be sure to meet with a very heavy punishment. I cannot see a reason to make a distinction in the sentence I am about to pass. In regard to that sentence, if I could conceive any case of forgery worse than this, I should have endeavoured to take into consideration whether such punishment less than the maximum might have been sufficient. But as I cannot conceive a worse case, I see no reason for mitigating the sentence. That sentence is that each and all of you be kept in penal servitude for life. And in addition to that sentence, I order that each one of you shall pay one-fourth of the costs of the prosecution. Twenty years were passed by before the last of these criminals was released. Bidwell lived to write the story of his infamous crime. As for the rest, as for the rest. Have you noticed one thing about this story? At each stage, the almost perfect crime was spoilt not by the vigilance of the bank or the law, but by those little errors which, as we've learned in this series, time after time give the criminals away. If Bidwell had been a little less greedy, he might have escaped. Remember, those two bills which led to their downfall were not detected because they were forged, but because he'd forgotten to fill in the date. Again, after all Bidwell's ingenuity to avoid arrest, he put the police on his trail in Dublin by forgetting to pack his scarf. The Bank of England robbery was called the crime of the century. But like most other crimes, it was far from being perfect. Well, that's all for now. At our next meeting, I hope to be able to tell you more of the secrets of Scotland Yard. The Secrets of Scotland Yard is distributed by the Center for Telecommunication Services, the University of Texas at Austin, by special arrangement with the Overseas Programming Companies Limited. This is the Longhorn Radio Network. We're your...